in the home stretch. This is um, part of five week class, um, seminar class. Today's lecture is scheduled for two hours. We're going to be communicating in real time. If you're on Slack, by uh, hashtag broadcast questions. And let me make sure I got the right channel. So, as we have been doing, we want to make sure that we're here and ready to arrive. Make sure our notifications are off. thinking about the way in which TSA pre-check, when you get into that program, your physical body moves through the whole, se the whole system faster because you have increased your um, insight to your digital avatar. So you're moving your digital data through faster. You've provided additional information and various kinds of um, approvals. And when your digital self can move through faster, your physical self goes through faster. And it's just amazing how much different the experience is for one or the other. And it's really because you've made your digital self go through the system faster. So that's sort of an interesting way in which we, you know, that, that code is affecting us. But actually the one that, we also talked about grocery stores and the way at a grocery store checkout. Um, also, we're not showing slides locally, so that's a problem. So um, and let me see if I can fix that for a second. Pause, stand by, stand by. Why aren't we showing flat up on the screen? I don't know. Plugged in, that's good. Oh, we just gotta convince it that it wants to display it. Some okay, let me, if you guys happen to be watching the YouTube presentation, let me know if I can make it funky there. I think we're okay. Okay, so the, we talked about the grocery store as well and the way in the grocery store you have um, not so much your physical avatar going through the system, but you have kind of a digital avatar of the products you're buying going through the system. And it's not that hard to get a can of beans out of the store, but if you want to get the can of beans out of the store, you also have to get the can of beans as digital version out of the store as well. So it's got to go through the inventory system and you've got to present money. And um, you know, what happens if your can of beans scans and it's more expensive than what it says on the shelf? The price is kind of the price that's in the database, not the price that's on the shelf. And if you happen to remember that the price on the shelf was different, well, you can sort of stop the whole process and get a manager and probably get the whole system to um, address that. But really the thing that's stopping you from getting the price that's put on the shelf is because the digital version of the beans won't go through the SIFT system at the physical price. That's an example where you know a product digital version takes precedence over the physical version, even though they're supposed to be in sync. Um, so I want to just tell a brief story, a similar one that happened um, to me when trying to go through a toll booth. This isn't the actual toll booth that I was going through. It's a, it was a similar situation where I was um, going onto a highway and there was a toll. It was different than what this picture shows because um, the one that I was going on wasn't, um, didn't have a, t a toll booth operator working on it. It was completely automated. And it didn't have, um, no, it did, it did have a situation like this, except that it didn't have a, it didn't have a gate that was going down. It just had cameras to check to see whether or not you were blown through the toll booth without paying. So I pulled up, knowing it was a toll booth, and um, got ready to pay. But there wasn't any way to pay with cash. You had to have fast track, um, and there wasn't like a swiper or a throw or you know throw money into it thing or something like that. And so I'm sitting at this toll booth and there are cars behind me and I have money, but, and there's nothing in front of me. There's nothing in front of me stopping me from driving through, but I'm stuck. I can't get out of the toll booth and it's not my physical self that's stuck. It's this weird digital version of myself, the digital version that has the market forces in place and a little bit of legal regulations, although the, the legal regulations around private toll roads are, are a little bit 
odd to me. But so I was in the situation where I couldn't get on the toll road, you know, according to social norms, I guess, because I couldn't pay. But it wasn't because I couldn't pay because I didn't have money. It was because I couldn't pay in the right way, in the digital way. So, I mean, I ended up having no choice but to just blow through the system without paying. And of course, it got, you know, my license got captured on camera and eventually I got a bill for 60 bucks in the mail for the otherwise $2 toll. But all, not because I did anything wrong, but because there wasn't as much capacity for handling the physical version of you as there was for the digital version. No. Yeah, I have this awful relationship with the toll company. The toll, I think it's the same toll company in San Francisco as the one in Orange County that I had um, my encounters with. And um, I had a lot of encounters with them that I don't want to talk about on camera. So we'll just we'll just we'll just leave it at that. I me and the toll road company didn't get along very well. Um, yeah, so it's just interesting to think about the way in which you know this is all regulated by code. Somewhere there's just uh, there's a database, there's a camera, there's a connection, there's a link to another database, and there's a bunch of rules in place. So we're increasingly regulated by that code, and so the ability to have access to that code kind of becomes a sort of maybe not a human right, but a civic right. Like your ability to see what is the code that's controlling you is something that, as citizens, for those things that are government regulated, I'm not sure if Pullbooth falls into that or not, but we should certainly have some insight to what the code is. That's controlling our bodies and our, you know, our lives as we move around the system. It's an argument for open source software. Okay, that's a high level. Meanwhile, down on the ground, we've got a drone programming assignment that's due on Wednesday. Took a little bit of time last class to look at that. We got a quiz on chapter 17, which is due Thursday, and that's a good um, um, preparation for the final, which is on Friday. Uh, I put the um, links into Canvas for the final. There are two links in there, or two assignments. One is a placeholder for the in-person exam, and the other is the version for Proctor Free. And I, I intended to assign all the different people to either in the class to either one or the other of those options. So if you go onto Canvas and you don't see one of those assigned to you, let me know, because you, it should be in your to-do. For those that are taking it locally, it'll be at 1015. It's a two-hour exam. Um, can coordinate that and we're gonna I'm gonna probably have someone come in and help me proctor it. Um, remote folks that are taking it you can take it anytime starting at 1015 according to Canvas. I don't know if Canvas is treating things in local time or time zone. I'm actually kind of flow actually if you're watching this still in South Africa and you could give me feedback about what time Canvas says the exam opens on Friday that'd be really helpful for me. Because if it says 10:15 local time, I'll know that Canvas is translating everything into local time, and that can help me set the window more effectively. Um, our finals on Friday, and so we are talking about trees for the next three lectures before we do our final exam. Uh, and administratively, do we have any glitches going on? Everything's okay. All right. So last time. We spent our class setting up the drone world assignment and dealing with the ghost and the speakers. Um, just or to re reiterate, this assignment is supposed to be an opportunity to manipulate all the different technologies that we've been working with, the classes, the data structures, the control structures, um, in order to solve a problem. And it's kind of open-ended. It's supposed to give you some creativity in how you want to solve it. Hopefully, it'll be fun. I mean, anything you do in the context of a class has an upper limit on how much fun it is. But still, it's at least got good graphics. Um, and so in class, we were able to work through a couple um, glitches that people had. I'm a little worried about folks remote that are trying to get into the um, assignment, figure out how to do it. Um, so what I think I'd like to do is just to start off by doing a quick example of the drone world controller and um, walk through how you would go about designing a controller that is going to go to a random place. Right now we have them going to just one particular place, but it might be helpful to see some examples of how we do that. So we're gonna do this example, and then we're gonna get into chapter 17, which is trees. Um, and uh, I guess it's 
probably and it's going to be too confusing to share by SARS because you, we would have to transfer all of the um, the graphics and everything. So I'll just put it on the screen. It's not a lot of it's not a lot of code. Um, and then I guess what I can do is I'll share the class after um, after class share the code after class in Canvas. Okay, all right. All right. So switching over to Eclipse and going to our drone world setup. Um, I've got it set up right now um, with my reference class, uh, my drone controller ske skeleton, which is my parent class of my drone controller and my simulation controller. Let's just take a look at what the simulation controller is doing. It's doing the same random numbers each time it's using the high resolution model. One of those high resolution models It's going kind of slow right now at 10. So I'm going to speed it up and go to speed it up to 50. It can go out of as high as 100. Uh, I'm not going to quarantine the drones in case I want to do debugging. I don't want the simulator to think that because I'm debugging, my drone isn't responding when in fact it's just waiting for me. Um, and then what I'm going to do is go into my drone controller and come down and edit the drone idling callback. So the drone idling callback to walk through the sequence of things that happened is when the simulator is controlling the drone, the drone will travel to some destination in the air. It'll finish being in transit. It will begin descending. It will land. It will allow all the passengers that want to get off at that destination will get off. Then the drone will recharge. And then you'll get the callback for drone idling. So at the moment at which you get called for drone idling, you've completed your last transit. Anyone that wants to get off has gotten off. And you may have passed, well, in this case, we only have one passenger. So you may have one passenger on board. Uh, that would be the case where the passenger wants to go somewhere in particular, and you're not at that place. Or you might have no one on board. Those are two cases. And then the place where you're landing, the place where you are, might have a passenger waiting to get on board and might not. So there's kind of four situations that you can look at for your specific location. So I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to let you guys work through those sorts of issues. But what I do want to do is I want to change the um, situation here so that we go to a random place and just to show you how I think through that. So after calling my super class and all that's going to do is it's I can follow that by put hovering on there and doing F3 and that will take me to the, the super class code. Um, that's just going to output a little message saying that I got drone that drone idling was called. And then line 33, we're checking to see where the drone currently is because we don't want to send the drone to that place. Then line 35, we ask the simulator to get, give us the global list of all places that are available to us. And so that's going to be come back as a tree set. So it's a set, meaning each individual place is unique. And it's a tree set, meaning that it's ordered in some kind of way that's dictated by the place object. So this is a good example of a natural ordering not being obvious. If it was a tree set of strings, we would know that when we had an iterator going through that tree set of strings, we would get things back in alphabetic order. Um, we're not sure exactly how place returns things. We could look, and when we, the place we would look is in the place class, and we would look to see if place has compare to implemented. And let's see actually what I did there. If we follow that place object by putting my cursor on place and then hitting F3 to go follow it, we can go to the implementation of the place class. You can see that, oh yeah, in fact, it does implement comparable, so there must be a compare to method. I'm going to use this window over on the right to go there quickly. And there's compare to place. And you can see what the logic is that it uses to compare two places. And after checking to see whether the thing that it's comparing to is null or not, if both things have a name, you can see that it's just returning the lexicographic order based on names. So all other things being equal, if both places have a name, they get sorted in alphabetic order by name. If, they, if one of them doesn't have a name for some reason, then you go into this fallback position of ordering by um, where it is and ordering it by how many people are waiting to embark. But they all have names, so it's always going to be in lexicographic order. Just FYI about how you can go through doing that. You don't often need to make a decision based on the alphabetic order of a place. You have now this set of places. And the first thing that we do in 36 is we remove the place where we currently are from that set because we don't want to pick our destination and include the place where we currently are. On line 38, we just have a check to make sure that we have a certain number of places set. And this is actually have a certain number of places in our set. 
that we call the size method in order to see how large our set is. And between line 38 and 39 is where I want to add the randomness. Rather than going to the last place, which you see I'm doing in 42, and then declaring that I'm going to the last place in 40 by calling places.last, I want to pick a place out of my set of places randomly. Now we know that places, we know that sets don't support ordering. So being able to pick something randomly out of a set is difficult. You can pick the first one or the last one if you have a tree set, and that's going to be alphabetically first or alphabetically last. But we can't pick index four, index five, because sets don't have, a, don't have an ordering the way lists do. So what we're going to do is we're going to put all of the places that remain after taking away the one that we're currently at in line 36, we're going to put it into a set so that we can choose one randomly, so that we can use the get method to choose one randomly. So I'm going to create a variable, which is going to be a list, and we'll use the implementation, a list of places, and um, we'll say list of places. That's my variable name. I'm going to set it equal to a new array list that contains places. I'll, that will declare my variable and create a reference to a blank array list. Let me see what's going on here. Keep, keep forgetting to say new because I'm doing Objective C recently in Swift. And then we'll import our classes, making sure we import java.util as the package. All right, so now into our list of places, we're just going to move, we're going to put everything that is in our tree set. And so to do that, we have to call the add all method. And that's going to take everything that's in our set and it's going to put it into the list. And I'm not sure what order it's going to be in. I mean, I presume it's going to be in the order of the iterator that goes through the set. And since it's a tree set, I assume that it's going to be alphabetic, but I don't really care. Because what I'm going to do is now I'm going to figure out what is a random element from that. And I had to put it in a set so that I could index it by number. So now I'm going to get a new random number. I don't know that we've talked about random numbers in Java in this class. I know the textbook has covered it, but I don't think we've talked about it in the lecture. There are two ways to get a new random number um, that I want to let you know about. One is to use create a random number object using a random number generator that's present in the Java util package. So this creates a new random number generator and then we can say please give me a random number <coughs> between 0 and the number of places we have. So if we look at what nextint does, it says it's going to give us a random number between 0 and the specified value, but it's not going to give us the specified value. So if there's 10 things in our, in our list of places, we're going to get a number between 0 and 9, which is exactly what we want, because we want to index into it. This is one way to get a random number. This code has another way to give you a random number that might be more helpful, and that's instead of calling random, new random, we can get our random number at, uh, generator from our simulator. I'll explain why. We can get, get simulator dot get simulation controller dot get random. And the reason why that's different is because that's going to be the random number generator that the simulator is controlling and that's going to be controlled by that flag that we have about whether you get new random numbers each time or not. And if you say, give me the same random numbers each time, and you use this random number generator, you're going to get the same random numbers each time so that you can debug it and not have that different situation every time you debug it because you're getting new random numbers. So these will be random, but they're going to be the same random. They'll be pseudo-random. Okay, so given that, we have a way of making random numbers, and then we pick a random number that's going to be between 0 and the number of places that we have, and we're going to store it next random, and then the place where we're going to go to, we'll say place place to go to is going to be list of places. So that's all the places we can go to minus the place where we currently are. And we'll say get the next random position. That gives us the place to go to. And then we just tell this, the simulator, rather than going to the last place, go to the place to go
you have to pass in the name of some of the do list to fix that. All right, so in this way, we've picked a random element from our list of places, and we say every time we idle, we're going to pick a random place to go to. And we're gonna we're gonna say we're also gonna say to the um, to the person getting on board that that's where we're gonna go to. You know what? I'm I'm gonna show you one other thing that might be interesting. Rather than telling the passengers where I'm going in the next spot, I'm gonna say to the passengers that I'm going everywhere. And if I tell the passengers that I'm going everywhere, when I land a passenger, if there's a passenger there, they're gonna get on board no matter what. Because I said I'm going everywhere. And then they'll stay on board until I bop around and land on the particular place where they wanted to go. If I'm going randomly, eventually I'll land there. So the other thing that you can do, rather than saying one specific space, place you're going to, is you can just say all the places that you're going, you're going to. And that would just be get simulator that get places. That is all the places that are present. And why why didn't that work out? What is it? It wants a set. Oh, a set of strings. Yeah. So that's I should fix that. What the drawn manifest wants is not a set of places, but a set of strings. All right. This is going. This is a little more than I wanted to do, but let's go ahead and create this. We'll create a set of strings, which are places. So that's going to be a new hash set of strings. With nothing in it. Import them. Import them. And I'm already using places. Oh yeah, I'm already using places. Uh, we'll call it places as strings. I'm going to do a fast enumerator that goes through each one of the places in the to total list of places. And I'm going to add the string to my set. All right, so all, all I'm doing is creating a set where I'm copying over all the names. So that down here in my drone manifest, I can say places as strings. Let me comment this. Get a random number, pick a destination, pick the random destination. Create a set of all destinations as strings. And then tell the passenger where the drone is going, which we're saying we're going everywhere. And then tell the simulator where to go next, which is the place to go. All right. So now if we save all that and we run it, see if I can run it full screen. Wait for the model to load up. It's full screen, you can't see what it's doing. So that's not good. But it's a presentation. All right, so now the drone controller is landing. It's picking up a person because the person thinks we're going everywhere. And the drone is just picking a random location to go to each time it idles. That person is going to stay on board until we happen to land at the place where they wanted to get off. Um, but until we do that, they're just going to stay on. You can see that in the graph at the bottom, I have one red bar that indicates the fact that I'm carrying one passenger and that there is a whole bunch of green ninjas that are waiting. So we could make this a little bit better by maybe not going someplace randomly, but instead considering where the place person who is on board would like to go and go there instead. Oh, look at that. I got lucky and the passenger happened to want to get off at the location I randomly chose. That's why the green, why Patterson got one green bar. And then at that same location, there was someone else that wanted to get on. So now I've got a person on my drone with the red, that indicates the red bar, 
and they're just not leaving because I'm not going to know that. Right? Questions about that? Thoughts on that? Okay. Then, go back to our content for today. And shift gears. What we're going to start talking about today is trees. And trees are a data structure. The basic idea is that trees are a data structure. And in a lot of ways, I think the trees are closest to what the data structure that cle the data structure that we have seen so far um, that trees are most similar to are linked lists. And that's because linked lists consist of a sequence of nodes that are connected to each other by a reference. And trees also are, have nodes within them that are connected by references. But what makes a tree different is that they can have multiple connections instead of just one. So a linked list formed a chain, and there's just one step you could go in each, each step along the way. But trees actually have multiple choices about directions that you could go. So it's like the difference between just going down a road where the road just continues one step at a time, or hitting an intersection where at every intersection you can go three different ways. Um, the road with no intersections is like a linked list, and the road with intersections where you can make choices is like a tree. So a tree is hierarchical. And so here's a representation on the screen of an uh, abstract tree. Each one of those boxes represents a node, and that, those no that node can hold data in it. But you can also see that it has links to other nodes that are of the same type. And that in this case, each node has multiple, um, uh, multiple other nodes as well. I think it's kind of funny that computer scientists have decided to call this a tree. Because if you look at the picture of the tree, you can kind of understand what's happening here, I hope. The, the data structure has links that are branching out, and that sort of has this tree structure. But a tree itself branches out up, and we almost always draw, draw trees branching out down. So as much as we like to call it a tree, it's actually kind of more like this, where we say the top is the root, and we say the bottom are the leaves. It's sort of messed up. And I don't, I don't actually know if anyone gets confused by the fact that we draw our trees upside down, but that's kind of the um, way that we work with our vocabulary. The other place that we get a lot of our vocabulary from, tr for, from trees from is from family trees. So we're kind of familiar with the idea of a family tree where the descendants and the, you have descendants and you have relationships and the relationship between the different people are parent and sibling and child. And we talk about a family tree the same way that we talk about computer science trees if you make the analogy between a family tree where a person is a node. And that makes a little bit more sense because family trees you usually draw from ancestors down to descendants. And that's a little bit more like a tree. So if you compare it to a linked list, over on the left is a linked list. And you can see that there are also nodes in a linked list. But the follow-on nodes only come one at a time. There's only one arrow that you can follow. But in a tree, there are multiple arrows that you can follow. And if you were to just follow the arrows on the far left of that tree, it actually kind of resembles at least topologically, the linked list. But as soon as you add the links to the right of that, it no longer has the same properties as the linked list. And it's, it's the fact that you can branch that gives, its tr gives trees the distinctiveness that, they, um, uh, that we use in our algorithms. So let's, um, let's take a look at the, some tree vocabulary. So the first vocabulary term, we've already used it, is the word node. And the stars up here indicate which one of those things are nodes. All of them are nodes. Nodes are anything that are part of the tree construction. In any given tree, there is one node that's special, and that's called the root node. And the root node is at the top of this tree. It is the node that has no parents. Um, all trees have one. If they have any nodes, they have one root node. And that's the place where all of your um, searching through a tree begins from because you follow links out from that root node to the other elements of the tree. So in contrast to the root, we have the leaves of the tree. 
The leaves of the tree are nodes that have no children. Now notice that the fact that they're at different levels of this tree doesn't make it a leaf. What makes it a leaf is that regardless of what level of the tree it's at, there are no more levels below it. And also notice that it doesn't matter whether you have one outlink or two outlinks. What makes it a leaf is that you have no outlinks. So you could have one or two or more, but only the ones that have no outlinks are leaf. The opposite of a leaf is called an interior node. And an interior node sounds like it might be something special, like something in the middle of the tree in some way. But in fact, an interior node is just any node that's not a leaf. So the root is an interior node as long as there's more than one node in the tree. And in this particular drawing, we have a total of three interior nodes. So they're nodes that are not um, the end or the bottom of the tree, like a, a branch in a physical tree. There are some words that we use for relationships between nodes. So we talk about whether a node is a parent or not. And you can't really talk about a node being a parent without having a base node that you're thinking about. So it's really a relationship. So in this case, we have the white, the, the node that's um, indicated with the white star has it one parent, and it is the parent with the node with the red star. Any given node can only have one parent, and that parent is unique. But not all nodes have a parent. For example, the root. The root is the one node in a tree that doesn't have a parent. All other nodes are going to necessarily have a parent. And unlike a family tree, you only have one parent. It's more like, I guess, a bacteria's family tree. So parent describes a relationship. Well, very similarly, you can have a child relationship as well. Now, what's different about a child relationship is that you can have zero children, you're a leaf. You can have one child. You can have two children. You can have as many children as um, your data structure indicates, um, even, though, um, even though you can only have one parent. Um, a child is a direct descendant. So, Sometimes we hear language like grandchild in a tree. You, see, you run into that a little bit in HTML programming. But for the purposes of our data structure, a child is just the direct descendant. And again, it's a, it's a relationship between nodes. Um, so any given node ha can have child, a child, or it can have children, or it can have none. Using the metaphor of the, of the family tree, you can also talk about nodes being siblings to one another. And a sibling, you, any node can have zero siblings, that would be like a leaf down at the bottom, well, not even on our tree, but the one on the bottom left has zero siblings. The one that's indicated on the slide with the white star has three siblings. The siblings are indicated with the red stars. And again, like parent and child, sibling is a relationship between nodes. It's not a characteristic of a node by itself. You have to be talking about two nodes in order to say whether or not they have a sibling or Another relationship that we've got is the relationship of ancestors. Ancestors is like the extension of parent. You can have multiple ancestors. You can have zero ancestors if you're the root. You can have one ancestor, or you can have many more ancestors. Um, only the root has no ancestors. This is also a relationship between nodes. This is a relationship between one node and a set of nodes, if you think about that. You can actually say it's a relationship between one node and a list of nodes as well, because the ordering of the ancestry could be ordered by direct parent and grandparent, and so on and so forth. You can have more than one ancestor. Well, likewise, you can have descendants. So this node here, this the white node, has many descendants. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven descendants. And unlike the ancestors, it's really a relationship between one node and a set of nodes. Because unless you have some way of putting an ordering on all the descendants, it kind of naturally just means that you either are a descendant or you aren't a descendant. And that's more like a set than a leaf than a list. So only a leaf has no descendants, just like only a root has no ancestors. And again, this is a relationship between nodes. It's not a property of a single node by itself. Another vocabulary term that we have is we have the idea of a subtree. And a subtree is some kind of a tree that starts at an interior node. Well, I guess it could start at any node and, and all its descendants. So you can pick any node in a tree and take all its descendants, and it becomes a subtree. So over on the right, we have a subtree that's rooted at the node with the white star. And it has a total of three nodes in that subtree, the white node and all its descendants. 
Moving on in our vocabulary, we have the idea of a path. A path is a sequence of nodes where each node is a child of the previous node. And so that's kind of important because in, an, in a tree, there's this ordered relationship between nodes. You can only go down the tree, given the way we've drawn it here. So a path has to be following the arrows. It can't, be, it can't go either way. So in this case, we have, I listed four different paths there. So A comma C is a path through the tree. It starts at the root and goes to a leaf. That's a path from top to bottom. But D by itself is also a path. It's just one node in a path. B and F is a path. It's a path that doesn't start at the root, but it is a path that's valid in this tree as well. And then finally, A, E, G is a path that goes from the top to the bottom. An example of something that's not a path would be A, E, G, H, because you can't follow arrows in this tree and go from G to H. In a path, you're not allowed to go backward through anything. trees have heights. There's a little bit of variation in computer science literature about height, how heights are calculated, but we're, for the purposes of this class, going to calculate heights as the number of nodes that are on the, in the tree that you're looking at. And it's the number of nodes that are in the longest path in the tree. So the height of this tree, you could see how someone might say, well, the height of this tree could be two, because you can go from A to C, and that has two nodes. But because we define the height as being the longest path in the tree, the height of this tree is three, because there's a path A, B, F that has three nodes in it. There are actually three different paths that have the height of the tree. A, B, F, and A, E, G, and A, E, H, all of those have paths that are of length three. If you, if you draw a comparison back to the idea of the linked list, you can see that a linked list is kind of like a subset of a tree. You know, a linked list is like a tree where you only have one child at each node. And so in that way, you can kind of, if you think about it in your head, you can think about the linked list as being a special case of a tree. Or the other way around is you can say, well, we know about linked lists. We're going to broaden our idea of what a linked list is to include this, these other ways of um, talking about node connection. Okay, so here's a question for you guys. What is the height of the subtree rooted at By it, two. Who's right? The subtree rooted at E has three nodes. The longest path from E to a leaf is two, E, G, or E, H. Let me ask you some other questions just to get the, get the uh, vocabulary going. How many leaves does this tree have? One vote for five, one vote for two votes for five. Yes, five. Um, what are all the names that you can give to node B? Like, what are some terms that describe it? Good. Root of the, well, it's a, could be, it could be the root of a subtree rooted at B, but that's a little circular. Parent of F, child of A, the, uh huh. It's an ancestor of F and a descendant of A. Good. Can you? Is there a relationship between B and H? If it was a family tree, it'd be like a niece or a nephew, but we don't really use, we don't often encounter that terminology in, in the data structures. Um, is there a path between B and H? No, because you'd have to go backwards on a link, and this is um, this is called a directional. Uh, it's a directional tree, and so it's a special case of a graph called a directional graph, and you're not allowed to go the other direction on. There are other kinds of data structures where you can go both ways, so that you, 
you either can think of it as an arrow with heads at both sides, or you can think of arrows going both between A and B and B and A, in which case you can move around more generally. That's kind of like a road map with, with um, roads between cities. This is like a road map with, where each node is a city, but all the roads are one way. Or you're a bunch of toll roads and only like you. There are other places where you encounter trees in computer science. You probably have run into them a lot of places, but maybe didn't think of them that way. So if you think about the file system. So this is a snapshot of um, the, my development folder on my computer. And um, if you think about it, you can think about the folders as being nodes and the children of folders either being other folders or files. And if you think about it that way, this can be thought of as a tree where the, the files are all leaves of the tree and folders are all interior nodes of the tree. And a path in this tree would, if you labeled it with the labels of each of the folders or file names, would tell you exactly where a file is in your hard drive, starting at the top of your hard drive and going all the way down. We don't often, in the file system, need relationships like sibling or ancestor or, de or, or um, descendant. And, it's, and you know, we also have the ability to search our file system in order to just find files using a search functionality. Um, but before that was available, everything had to be organized in a tree. And so people were pretty careful about making sure that their trees made sense so that you could find a file later using the organization that's present in your tree. Now, now I feel like students that I encounter are a little bit more casual about where they put files on their hard drive because they assume they're going to be able to find it with search, which, by the way, is not true. I, that, that was sort of facetious. I, I recommend being... Um, meticulous, we'll say meticulous, about ordering your files on your hard drive so that you can find them again in the future. Um, another place that we've encountered it are, has been in inheritance trees. So if you remember from Python and CS10, we did this example of doing questions for a test, and we used the class structure of having questions and choice questions and multiple choice questions in order to build out um, a little, you know, Canvas-like question quiz system. And those relationships between the classes had an inheritance hierarchy. And we've, we have an inheritance hierarchy in Java, too. We're using it. We haven't talked about it quite so explicitly. But the drone controller skeleton, for example, is a parent of the drone controller that you are working with. And a parent of the drone controller skeleton is something called the object, which is the root of all objects in Java. And so there is a class hierarchy that exists that works like a, a tree structure as well. Where else? You guys think of any place else that you encounter trees in your daily life? Tree, tree structured data, not actual trees. Canvas, yeah. What, like what? What aspect of Canvas? Like. Yep. Module. Modules have assignment. Yep, that's a good example. Restructuring Canvas. If you, if I mean, if you are a little bit generous with your interpretation, you can think about like a drugstore or a grocery store as kind of having a hierarchical relationship where you have aisles. And then the aisles have sections, you know, and you've got, you know, the spice aisle, and you've got ketchup, and then you've got all the kinds of ketchup or whatever you're looking for. That's a little bit of a stretch, maybe. They have a whole aisle dedicated to peanut butter and jelly? Yeah. That's really funny. Uh-huh. 
I, I think it's a little funny how grocery stores organize their, their stuff because th there's all kinds of psychology and marketing that go into it. You know, like all the milk and um, is at the back because people often just come by to get milk and so that you have to walk through the whole store, possibly picking up other things in order to get the milk. Um, end caps, of course, are used to promote certain kinds of things because you see that a lot easier. Um, products that, um, geared towards kids are on lower shelves. Um, the, the more basic foods like the rice and the um, dried um, beans and stuff are all lower. And what's at eye level are all sort of like um, high profit item, high profit value items. I think that's all it is. And man, like some stores, if you want to buy apricots, for some reason dried apricots are like in eight different places in the store and they all have different prices. It's like in the produce, in the baking, in the international section, and then like in the organic, you know, place. Oh, different. Yeah. I, I could really go on and on and on about grocery stores. And all my challenges. With them. What's my favorite? Uh, I Trader Joe's. Yeah, I love Trader Joe's. I feel like I feel. Yeah, that's okay. We'll we'll save. Well, yeah, we'll we'll save my criticism of grocery stores for a time when I'm not being arrogant forever. Um, I just have a lot of confidence in the food that I buy at Trader Joe's isn't um, it's high quality. And I feel like, yeah, enough said about that. Um, you know, sometimes buildings or campuses will be arranged hierarchically. So you have like campus, and then you maybe have different regions of campus, a science region, an engineering region. And then you have a building, and then in the building you have rooms, and maybe within the rooms you have seats. Um, where else might we encounter trees? Where's that? Like Netflix. Netflix? Like where where they do the tree being like categorization? Profile, TV, movie, then I'm sorry, like documentaries or action or something. So actually, if you think about it, anytime you have strong categorization, the categorization is often in tree structures. Um, it's just convenient for being able to um, remember information. The uh, smartphone settings are often a tree. Uh, we were looking at that. All right, so those are that's the general idea of a tree. When it comes time to actually implement a tree, we have to um, add a little bit more overhead to that. So if we want to tre create trees in code, we're going to have to make something that looks a little bit more like this. And so in this case, you can see that we have several different um, nodes that are labeled node, because that's the name we're going to give the class. And the root node is the one that has the data Elizabeth II there. But at the very top, we have a class called the tree class. And this is the abstraction. So when people as application programmers use the tree that we're about to make, they're going to use the tree class. And those node classes are internal to our object. And we're not going to allow our external clients of the tree to see our nodes or to work with our nodes. We're going to give them other methods that are, live at the level of the tree node, at the, of the tree object, so that they can interact with the tree. But we're going to keep all the nodes private so that we have control over the access to the tree um, explicitly. So in this case, this is a tree that has one, two, three, four, five, six nodes, not seven, because that top tree node is not part of the tree. That's part of our management of the data structure. And the height of this tree is three, not four, because it's rooted at that node that's labeled Elizabeth II. Um, you can see that our nodes contain data, and they contain children, but both of those are references. So our data node is a reference, in this case, to a string. It could be a reference to anything, a reference to a place. If you wanted to keep track of your drones in a tree structure, your, your places from the drone control in a tree st structure, you could make data be a reference to a tree. And so likewise, we can, we can use generics in order to say, well, we don't really, just like in a list, we didn't really care about what the data was as long as we were consistent about it. We also kind of don't really care about what the data is in the tree. Because what's important to us about the way we're going to work with the tree is about the structure of the nodes, not necessarily the data that's present in it. 
Later on, we're going to need the um, we're going to need the data to be comparable, but we're not going to necessarily need to know anything else about it besides that. All right. So if we look at this, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to at, um, implement. We're going to um, I phrase this badly. We're going to abstract the implementation behind a tree class. So we're going to allow users to use the tree class, but not the internal node class. And so for that, we want to give them the constructor. So let's start and try and code this up. And so what we're going to focus on right now is just the construction of our tree class and the different pieces that are present in it. Um, OK, so let's, uh, let's do that. Um, I don't have a class all set up for us, unfortunately. Let's Second. All right, so let me make a project for us, and I'll share this over um, Saros so we can work on it together. 21, tree. All right, my disk's. Um, do you mean in real life or in my example? Um, in real life. I don't, I don't know. My obsession with the... I think you do. I think we do hear it. Don't we hear about Princess Anne every now and then? Yeah, because they're all, they're all past the inheritance of... Um, Megan and Harry now, right? Because it goes, it would go through. This is not my expertise; it's just my obsession. But I think it goes through all of um, Charles's family before it would go to the next. So it's Charles, but we're just. It must be, yeah. It's like a depth first traversal of the tree in order to get um, inheritance. Yeah, and I think well, it was only. It, then it would go to go. It would go from William and Kate's kids, and then it goes to Megan and Harry. Uh, Harry, and then I don't think it ever. I don't think it ever goes to Megan. It would go to Harry's kids. Like I don't think it goes to Kate. It goes to William's kids, but not. Yeah, I, I think it's really. I think it's strange. Yeah. It's strange because, like, just recently the rules changed so that um, a girl could inherit the throne, and so one of William's kids is a girl that's in line for the throne for the first time. And I think it's weird that it's like, okay, we're just going to change that. <laughs> I know new new rule, new rule that we can be. Sure. Okay. Anyway, that's a little side side note. Okay. Um, so here is our project, and let's see if I can share it with you guys. Um, the yeah, I guess what I found interesting about that was actually thinking about the way in which you decide who is the succession to the throne. It's not. It's a depth for it's a depth first search through bloodlines, but not through marriage, right? So it's kind of like. Because because what we're talking about isn't doesn't quite have a map between family trees because our trees only have one parent, and family trees really have two parents you know to make a child. So if you kind of ignore the spouse that marries in, then we've got a tree that we can we can work with as data. I mean, of course, with computers you could represent that. There's no reason why you couldn't have um, two parents. It's just that in our formalism of a tree, we don't. We don't have that. All right. So let's see. I'm having all kinds of problems here. My system has run out of application memory. That's unfortunate. Okay, so let me shut down. Wow. Okay. Let's see. Quickly before everything breaks, let me exit Eclipse and restart it. And let me exit everything else I can exit. All right, well, let's see. We're just going to take a little break. What is a good time to take a break? Let's take a, 
Um, five minute break and come back at 11.26 while I try and fix the computational system. Five minutes.
Okay, we're back, and I think we got our technical issues ironed out, and we have shared the project, and now what we're trying to do is we're trying to go about implementing our tree that looks something like this, um, and we're going to do that in Eclipse, and we're going to do it with a new class, and our new class, we'll call it the tree class, and we will just get it put in a package. All right, and did that share with you guys okay? Okay, good. All right, so we said that we're gonna have this tree class, and in we know how to do generic, so why don't we go ahead and give it a type that's gonna be stored in it. So we know, we'll say it'll be a tree that contains elements of type T. We know that our tree class itself is gonna have to have a pointer to a node, and it'll be private. It'll be a node that we haven't declared yet, and that's going to be our root. So our root is going to be pointing to a node. And so within our tree class, we're going to declare a private class called node, which is a class that we can only use within the context of tree, just like we can put instance variables in. We can put our own classes in if we want. And we know that a node is going to contain some data, and that will be of type T. That makes sense. So if we want our tree to be filled with strings, when we when we use it, we'll instantiate it based on the pattern in line three as being tree full of strings. And then in our implementation, our node will have a pointer to a string on line eight. Then each node, in addition to having data, is going to have a list of nodes, which are its children. We'll import our array list. And we actually don't care about its implementation. All we care about is that it's a list. And so we're going to go ahead and just make it a list and say, well, we'll when we instantiate it, we'll implement it with something. But all we care about is the properties of it being a list. When we create a node for the first time, we're going to need to know what data we want to put in it. So let's make our constructor for our node. We'll say node, and please give me some data. And we'll assume that our node, when it's first created, has no children. So we'll say this.data equals data. So that will set our data right here. And then we'll say this.children equals a new array list filled with t's. So that'll give us an empty array list that we can add things to later if we want to. And not filled with T's, it's filled with nodes. Sorry, because that's not data, that's links to other nodes that contain data. All right, if we just look at our class node, does, do you feel comfortable with that definition of a node? It contains a reference to something of type T. We'll decide in the future. It contains a list of other nodes that are its children. When we build it, we have to build it with the data that we want to store in it, and we'll start with empty children. So we don't really have a way of adding any children to that node right now, but it's just a constructor. We go back to our diagram, and you see that the relationship here in this image, how that maps to what we just coded. We've got data, we've got the children. The children are a list of references to other nodes. And this is a reference to some type here, which could be a string. OK, well, that is our interior node class, which will be helpful for us to use. I just collapsed it. And so we also need a constructor for our, for our tree. And so let me collapse that and make that stay collapsed, please. Ah. So now the constructor for our tree, we're going to not need anything as our initial data. We don't need to start with anything in particular. And what we're going to do is we're going to initialize our instance variables. And so we'll, this will be public because we want people to be able to create our trees. And the root is going to be equal to a new node. And what are we going to put in it? Actually, we, no, we won't even start with that. We'll say in the beginning our, our root is null because we can have a tree with no nodes. That's OK. So that should be all we need for our constructor. And what we haven't done yet is we haven't actually given a way to 
um, add any data to our tree. So maybe what we could do is we could add something that uh, is an interface to our tree and we can say it's going to be public. It's not going to return anything and we're going to add something to our tree. What we'll do is we'll add um, a tree to our tree and we'll say our root is going to equal t.root. So that, that's just a, almost a way of just copying a tree in. But we're not really going to use that. So that's enough to at least have the data structures for this tree. It doesn't really talk about how we're going to build it out yet, but we can sort of think through how we might want to do that. Um, maybe, maybe actually we should think through it right now. Um, I hadn't actually considered how we want to build this tree out, but if we have a tree, and we want to we add another tree to it that's just going to initialize it but we still haven't added any data so maybe what we want to do how are we going to add data to our tree for the first time because in line 25 we assume we're passing in a tree but where's that tree going to come from we need some way of creating some data for our tree so maybe we should in the constructor well we want it to be have nothing so if we add a tree that has nothing in it. Hmm. Why don't we do this? Why don't we say, why don't we create a method that is um, create root and we'll pass in some data to create the root and then we'll say this dot root equals a new node and we'll make it with data. And then we'll also make something that is add child. And that makes more sense if we do tree tree. And we'll say root dot children dot add t dot root. And that'll splice in the tree. And then what and actually let's just get rid of that tree. Kind of, sorry, I'm making this up a little bit. All right, well, what we do when we create a new class is we do a little bit of a design of the public interface, and I, I skipped that step, and I'm paying for it now. And the other thing that we need to do is we need to write some tests, so let's try and make some tests for it. Uh, it's a tree test. We're good. We'll just go ahead and give me a basic test that I can work with, and it's going to offer to add JUnit 5 to the library for me. Great. Thank you, Eclipse. You're wonderful. And now we have a test, and so let's just practice making a tree. So what is it going to look like? Well, for starters, we can have a tree t equals a new tree. Um, and we just want to make sure that that doesn't throw any sort of exception. So if that does throw an exception, then we have an error. And we'll just fail. No exceptions. Okay, and now if we run that test with coverage, we should at least see that our constructor is getting called. Okay, great. So now let's try um, adding some data to our tree. Let's make another test. And we know that it's not going to throw any exceptions because we already tested that. And so now we can say, uh, oh, we need to specify what we're storing in our tree. Strings are convenient, so let's do strings. Do the same thing down here. All right, now we'll say t.create root, and we'll put Elizabeth in. And now, if we run it as a JUnit test, we should see coverage on create root. And if we ex and our node class, we'll see, because that required creating a node, we've actually created a whole node as well. All right, and then the last thing that we want to do is we want to consider adding a child. So let's uh, make another test. And we'll make one tree 
which has Elizabeth in it. And we'll make another tree that has uh, William in it. And then we'll say T1, add child T2. So that should put William as a child of Elizabeth. If we run that as our JUnit test, we know we're exercising all the code, but we don't actually have any way to check to make sure that it got built correctly, because we ha don't really have any way of working with our tree yet. But we'll, we'll add that in a second. So that actually gives us enough capability that we can build out this whole tree. So let's, if you can help me remember the names here. Oh, I got Charles, I mixed Charles up. All right, so if you can help me um, remember the names here, let's try and build this whole family tree out in a test. All right, so let's, we'll take this one, we'll use test three and do it instead. The T, we, and when we do this, we have to build it from the bottom because we added as children along the way. So the first two we've got are William and Harry. Uh, William and Harry, who are the children of Charles. Okay. So let's alter this and say T1 is Charles, T2 is William, and T3 Harry. And so we'll add T2 as a child to T1, and we'll add T3 as a child to T1. All right. In our next level up, then, we want to build out Charles, Anne, and Andrew, which are children of Elizabeth. Okay, help me. I'm not going to remember this. Okay, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right, what are what are our names? Anne and Andrew. And uh, we all do up to Elizabeth, this one. Okay, so we take what's that? I know Edward got cut out of the tree because they ran out of space. <laughs> no, no, I just cut out, got cut out because I just didn't have space for my tree. Um, okay, so yeah, this isn't a class in British royalty, it's a class in tree, so we, we don't worry about accuracy of the royal bloodline. Okay, so we need to add, so who did we already build? We built Charles, William, and Harry already, so we don't actually need another Charles node, so we don't actually need T4. Um, but what we need to add as children of Elizabeth, we have to say t7.addChild t1 and t7.addChild t5 and t7.addChild t6. And then 7 becomes the tree that we want to work with. And 7 has children of 1, 5, and 6. There's 5 and 6. And one has children of two, T and three, T two and T three. So I think we built out the tree okay. If we run it, we're not going to be able to verify it at all, but we're at least going to see whether it constructed that error. Okay, so that was pretty good. All right, so going back to our code, one of the reasons why we talk about recursion before we talk about trees is because almost all tree algorithms are recursive. And that's because it's very hard to iterate over trees in any way that um, makes sense without having to recurse on it as well. Of course, recursion and iteration can be replaced for one another, but it seems like there's a really natural fit for a tree for recursion. So if we wanted to ask how many nodes are in this tree, we could formulate that as a recursive question. The question could be, well, if we knew how many nodes were each in, our, in each of our children, then we would know how many nodes are in our tree, because it would be one plus the number of nodes in each of our children. So that's the way you formulate a recursive algorithm. You say, if I knew the answer to a smaller problem, I would know the answer to my problem. The smaller problem are the size of my subtrees. My problem is 1 plus the sum of the size of my subtrees. That's part of it. The other thing you need for a recursive solution is a way to end. 
that, that recursion. And well, you end that recursion when you have no more children. So that's easy enough. So let's add the ability to calculate the size of our trees to our um, code that we currently have. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to need to implement a size method. And our size method is going to be compri comprised of two different methods. So we're going to create a public interface for size that's part of tree. But we're also going to create a helper method in the node class called size as well. So we're going to have two methods in two classes, but only one of them is recursive. And so as we as we edit this, as we code this up, I want you to um, pay attention to which one is recursive and which one isn't. Okay. All right. So let's implement the size class. The first thing that we want to do is wow. Okay, come back. The first thing that we want to do is we want to create a method for it in our tree class, which is going to be public, and it's going to return how many nodes are in our tree. And it doesn't take any parameters because it's going to work on the root. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to return whatever our root says its size is. And so what we've done by making a little wrapper there is we've said, okay, well, the tree is going to expose a method to the world so that the world, a user of our class, can ask what the size of our tree is. But in order to get the answer to that, we're going to pass that question down to our node class. And our node class has to answer it as well. So in our node class now, let's implement a size method. And we will use the recursive formulation of it. Thank you for calling me. Not, I'm not ready to return anything. We're going to use recursive formulation. And we're going to say, we'll create a running variable called, uh, I'll call it aggregate. And we'll start it off at 1 because that's the one for the current node that we're at. So the size includes our node. And then what we'll do is we'll make a fast enumeration. And we'll say for each node that is in our children list, we will say aggregate plus equals n.size. And then we will finally we will return our aggregate number. A very, if you ask me, that's a very, very elegant solution. It's a recursive solution that's going to go through the whole tree and find out how many nodes are in it. There's not a, it's not very clear what the ending condition is in this recursion. Up till now, in our recursive solutions, we've seen things that th seen things that said things like if n equals zero, then return. Otherwise, do the recursion, or if we're out of characters in our string and the recursion. In this case, the way that we end our recursion is when we get to a node that has no children. Because if we get to a node that has no children in line 22, that fast enumeration will never run. It's OK, and children will just be an empty array. But 23 is where the recursive call is made. And so if we don't have any children, no recursive call ends up getting made. And we end up just returning 1 for the current node. Well, if this is working, then we should be able to add, add to our tests and see exactly um, whether or not we're getting the answer that we expect. Right now, our, we don't have any tests at all. So the only thing that we're doing right here is we're creating a tree, but we're not actually testing anything. A test would require an assert of some kind. So we'll go ahead here and use the only thing that we know, which is we, only, we can get answers back about the size of our tree. So we can say um, assert equals one t dot size and we should port that for equal no, come on what's wrong okay i always have trouble with cert equal i've never quite figured out what my deal is but we'll try one there we go. all right so that's equivalent to just testing whether something's equal or not. So if we run this now, we only have one place where we're calling size, and we can see whether we get good code coverage and the right answer. Okay, well, we got, we got the right answer. Did we get code coverage or not? I don't see any code coverage color. There we go. All right, so what do we see here in terms of how we ran our test? We, we ran all of our tests, but only one test calls size. That's test tree two. 
We called size, and what size does here is it calls the trees version of size, and then the trees version of size looks at the instance variable root and calls the size of this node. We see that we get aggregate of one, but for some reason line 23 isn't getting run. We're getting the right answer, but why didn't line 23 get executed? Why is it colored in red? It's related to what the ending condition is of the recursion. Ideas? Is the answer right? Is one the right answer for the size of our tree? Do you believe that? For this tree right here? Right, but down here we didn't actually call size. We're not seeing size get executed. Yet. I, so to clarify here, let me do this. Let me just do coverage on one test by itself. Okay, so now we've only run one test. And now you can see over on the left, line 23 is a good one. Okay, so you believe that this tree has one node. Yeah, there's no children. So we have one node in our example here, just Elizabeth. It has no children. So when we ask Elizabeth, what is your size? We get one for this node. We try and go through any children, but there are no children because we haven't added any. So we never call this. This just skips this because there's nothing in our empty array list. And then we just return one. So that worked out well. Now over here, we're going to get a different solution. So here we hope we have one, two, three, four, five, six elements in, it, in that tree. So what we hope is going to happen down here at the end, if we ask what the size of T7 is, then we hope, what did I just say it was? Six. Now if we just run this test by itself, Now you can see that this line does eventually get called through a recursive call. Because Elizabeth, we've added three children to Elizabeth, one, five, and six. And so when we start off asking for what the size of our tree is, we come in here, we look at the root. The root is Elizabeth's node. We come here, we say one for the Elizabeth node, then we go through each of the children. So that'll be a loop for Anne, Andrew, and Elizabeth. So then we recurse on Anne. Anne has no children, so we just return one. Andrew has no children, so we just returned one. Sorry, then we also added um, Charles. Charles has two children, so we recurse twice on those. And then as we come back out, we add up the sum of all the subtrees on the way back and eventually return the aggregate. Making, making the pattern look a little bit like this. One plus the size of each one of our children. Now, I, I would like to just, when I would write tests, to, when I write tests, I would actually test each stage here. So I would go ahead and at, make sure that T1 has the right size. I'd make sure that T2 has the right size, because otherwise I don't know whether or not that T3 actually did anything. I didn't actually test. So now after I add two children, we better see that T1 has changed to size three. I want five to have one, six to have one, Seven, we end, seven should have one at the beginning. Oops. You guys didn't catch me. So that should be good. But then after we add those children, then T7 should change to six. If we do that, cross the fingers, great. So all the tests worked out okay. Make sense? Elegant? Think so? So, 
which one of those size methods is recursive? If we come back and we look at our code, and we let's get our tests to go away, and let's get rid of the color coding. That can be a little bit hard to see. We have one node class internally here that has a size method, and then we also have the size method that's associated with tree. Which one of them is recursive? The one associated with node or the one associated with tree? This is like a, a it's a very it's a mechanical question because what makes a fun, a method recursive is if it calls itself. So node is going to be the recursive method because that's the one that calls itself and it calls itself right here. And this place right here, it looks like it calls itself because it has the word size and that's the name of the method. But if you resolve this, this doesn't get resolved to this method, regardless of the name. This gets resolved to this method. Because we're calling size, which is a member of the root reference, and the root reference is a reference to a node, not a reference to a tree. So this is the one that's recursive. And if you remember our discussion about recursion, this is a simple recursion, or a recursion where a method just calls itself which is different than the more complicated circular recursion that we saw in the expression tree, where you had a sequence of methods that ended up calling themselves in a circle, that would be harder to see. Because you, could, you can't just look at a method and say, oh, it calls itself, or it doesn't call itself, because you would have to look at a whole call chain to see whether or not a sequence of methods were circular or not. So this is simple recursion. And it is the node method that is the one that is recursive. Now, there are different kinds of trees, and there are different kinds of trees that vary based on the characteristics of the structure of the tree, but there's also some trees that um, vary based on the contents of the tree as well. So have, having described this basic tree that we just implemented, let me now give you a special case of a tree. And this special case is called a binary tree. And we use the word binary because there are two children for every node. Or more, more specifically, there's either zero, one, or two children for each node. But there's never three children or more. The one that we just implemented could have an arbitrary, arbitrary number of children because we had an array list for children. But the one that I've got on the screen here has just two references, a left reference and a right reference. Computer scientists like binary trees because it's the simplest kind of tree that can represent everything that the more complicated tree that we just um, did can. Um, you can cause a binary tree to have a similar structure to a tree that has multiple children if you know how to construct it the right way with left and right. But if you don't have a left and right, and you just have left, for example, then you don't have a tree. You have a linked list. So a linked list is like a binary tree that only has lefts or only has rights. And as soon as you add a left or a right, you have the minimal set of um, characteristics that make something a tree. So a binary tree has nodes that only have a left or a right, but otherwise they're the same. They have, they have uh, a data element, they have a hierarchical relationship, they have parents and they have children and they have siblings. Um, they, whenever you talk about a binary tree though, and you talk about siblings, you're only going to have zero or one sibling in a binary tree. It's like a tree in China under the one child policy. Mm, I guess that's not even right. The two child policy. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, it, the one child policy is still in effect, but if you and your spouse are both products of the one child family, you're allowed to have two children. To maintain maintain population levels. Yeah, it's really complicated social engineering. There's also exceptions if you're from a um, if you're from a rural area, if you're from an area that is like farm working, and there are various ways in which it's managed. Like if you have extra children, you can pay a fine, I think. And but the rules are changing a lot, so um, that that was the last time I heard what the rules were. So it does work, yeah, but it's not the one child policy. It's the, it's the two child. Okay, so our special case of a binary tree 
Each node has zero, one, or two children, um, and they are left and right, and we're going to keep track of them in code as left and right rather than as children and being an array of children. But what's interesting about this is that we can we use some different kinds of things in our life that um, have left and right children. Um, maybe not in your like, daily life, but there are different places where you encounter them. And one place that you encounter them is in knowledge management. So if you go into a doctor's office, for example, and you present with some kind of a symptom to the doctor, the doctor is going to follow a kind of decision tree in their head in which they'll make a decision and sit and they'll make a they'll ask a question or they'll give you a test and they'll say well do you have a cough do you have a rash is your rash like this is it a wet cough do you have a fever and each time they ask a question it's like traveling down a binary tree and going left or right based on a yes or no answer and when you arrive at a leaf of that tree you get a diagnosis and so different kinds of decision systems can be built on a binary tree so let me give you an example of two of them. So here's the first one. This is sort of an interesting one that I dug up on Wikipedia. This is a decision tree that expresses your likelihood of dying on the Titanic. And the way you read it is you, you, you start at the top and you ask a question at each node and you say, um, as a person on the Titanic, are you male? And if the answer is no, then you probably survive. If the answer is yes, then you ask another question. You say, are you over age 9.5? And if the answer is yes, then you probably die. If the answer is no, then you ask, did you have more than 2.5 siblings? And if you had more than 2.5 siblings, then you left is yes, so then you died. So your, your most likely case for surviving on the Titanic was being female, or being a child with no siblings. Kind of interesting, isn't it? This decision tree, there are ways in which you can generate decision trees like this from the data. So if you have a bunch of data that like lists everyone's gender and what their age was and how many siblings they have, there are algorithms that will create a tree like this that optimally calculate decisions that you want to, um, that you need to ask in order to determine whether someone survived or not. So you could put information about demographics, and then you could ask who's likely to pass a class. You could have a decision tree generated that way. But you could have a bunch of information about um, what your major was and you know outcomes for, for getting a job. You could have questions about um, preferences and like what book you're likely to um, want to read. Or are you do you want to read Harry Potter? Well, did you like? Star Wars, did you like Doctor Who, did you like Lord of the Rings, did you like Pride and Prejudice? All these kinds of questions could be used to predict whether or not you're going to like some other book in the same way. So, if, if you had lots of siblings, why didn't you survive? Probably because you're... Probably it was harder to, like, you were trying to stay together, and so it was probably harder to get on the boat, the lifeboat, if you were all trying to stay together. Whereas if you were like, yeah, if you're like, sorry, sis, <laughs> jumping on the boat, <laughs> you're good to go. Yeah. So another one you could do is a game of 20 questions, right? 20 questions is basically a decision tree where you ask questions, and the answer is yes or no, and at the leaf, you have an answer. So this is a real limited version of 20 questions a decision tree that you might have, but you might ask questions like, is it a mammal? Yes or no? If you answer yes, then you ask, does it have stripes? And if you say no, then maybe it's a pig. If you say yes, then you ask if it's a carnivore. And if it's yes, then it's a tiger. Because a tiger is a carnivore that has stripes and is a mammal. A zebra is not a carnivore, does have stripes and is a mammal. And so if you, have you ever played that game online, the, the tw version of 20 questions online that is pretty sophisticated. We can probably, let's see if we can find it real quick. Mm, okay, I'm scared to do it because Chrome crash. Okay, let's not do it. Um, what, what happens is that over time, the online systems will build up answers to a decision tree. And what happens is, is if it gets to the end of a um, leaf and it gets it wrong, for example, if it asks, is it a mammal? Does it have stripes? 
it says, oh, it's a pig. And you say, no, it wasn't a pig. It was a dog. And so the, then what, what the system will ask, or will come up with an answer somehow, is it will say, what is a question that I could ask that would differentiate between a dog and a pig? So maybe you could ask, does it have fur? And so you would add a node to this tree under does it have stripes that asks, does it have fur? So you'd say, is it a mammal? Does it have stripes? Does it have fur? No, it's a pig. Yes, it's a dog. And so then if you ask something like, um, what's, what's a mammal that doesn't have stripes, that doesn't have fur? A bat, maybe, or a bat? Yeah, bats are mammals. Didn't you see my new sticker? Where's my new sticker? Save, oh, yeah. save the bats. Um, mammal. Oh. Um, or the other side, is it a mammal? No, does it fly? What's a flying non-mammal? That's not an eagle. Oh, you know, like a robin, a blue jay. Is it a mammal? No. Does it fly? Yes. Is it an e it's an eagle. No, it's not. It's a blue jay. Oh, what's a question that would differentiate, differentiate between an eagle and a blue jay? Is it the national bird of the United States? Yes. Oh, then it's eagle. No, then it must be a blue jay. So you can see that by running this a lot of times with a lot of people and somehow getting feedback about ways to differentiate places where it made a mistake, you could make a really enormous decision tree that has just about everything. In it. And in fact, basically that's what, that's what they do. The only thing that the um, sophisticated online question answering systems enable is they enable more than two answers. So they don't necessarily make you answer yes or no. Sometimes they allow you to say probably or sometimes or I don't know. In which case they're probably not using the decision tree as the mechanism. All right, let me give you another example of a place in which a binary tree is used. Um, this is more of a computer science application. Um, something called Huffman codes. And Huffman codes are a way of compressing data without losing any information. So do you know how, like, when you take a picture, if you store it as a JPEG format, you, you lose some of the information? Like, if you have low-resolution JPEG, you get, like, blocky kind of effects. So a Huffman code, so that's, that's called a lossy compression meaning you make the file size smaller, but you throw away information in the process. A Huffman code is a way of making a file smaller, but not throwing away information, keeping perfect information about it. So the way a Huffman code works is it relies on a tree data structure, a binary tree structure, where each leaf has a symbol that you want to encode, so a letter, and following a left node, you put a zero on the code, and following a right node, you put a one on the code. And so the overall code for a symbol is made by following the path from the root to the leaf. Have you guys ever seen one of these before? OK, so this is a Huffman code for the Hawaiian alphabet. The Hawaiian alphabet has, I think, 13 characters in it. Um, and one of them is uh, a, you know, a sound, the little apostrophe there. And so if you wanted to encode aloha, what you would do is you would have to follow the path to all the letters. And each time you follow a path, you keep track of which letter you're currently working. Let me see if I can draw this out. So for example, in order to get to the A, you have to follow this tree. And in following the tree, you have to walk down a couple sets of nodes. So starting at the top, you go down this way, and then you go down this way. So you went right and left. So the code for an A is 1, 0. Now you go to the top again, and you find your way down to the L. So then you're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. The so four lefts, every time you go left, it's a 0. So 1, 2, 3, 4. The O involves going 1, 2, 3, oh, sorry, I messed up. 1, 2, and then right. So that's going to be 0, 0, 1 for the O. The H, where's our H? Down here. So that's going to be 0, 0, 0, 1. 0, 0, 0, 1. And then the A is going to be 1, 0 again. One, zero. So then using this Huffman tree, you can encode the word aloha as those characters we have up there 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 7, 8, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. It's a binary representation of aloha in characters. 
What's that? There's no action. Then if you, so that's how you encode something, but it's also super easy to decode something. So let's say you're presented with 101010. How do you decode that? Well, you start at the top of the tree and you say, okay, one goes right, zero goes left, that's an A. And then you start over. One goes right, zero goes left, that's an A. One goes zero, one goes right, zero goes left, that's an A. So you can just as easily encode and decode in this tree um, going either way. What's interesting about this is it doesn't treat all letters as being equal. How is it biasing letters? Like, What's the bias for the letter? Or how how what is it that's what is that that's different about the different representations for different letters? Well, what would be different about an encoding for an A versus an encoding for a P? We could do it. Well, we know the encoding for A, that's 0, 1. What's the encoding for P? Right? For P? All right, so that's A, and that's P. What's the difference between them? Or what's one of the differences? Yes, that's right. So, right. And so, what I said was this was this was a mechanism for compression. So, what things do you want towards the top of the tree? Yeah, the ones that are most frequent. So, the more frequent things are, the higher up you push them in the tree, and that means that you represent an A with what one third as many bits as you do with a P. And if in your document, and if in your language, you use a lot of A's, then that means that your files are going to be much, much smaller than if you use the same number of bits for every letter. And so just like you can use this tree, there's actually optimal ways of generating these trees. And basically, the way that you generate the tree is you just go through some corpus and you count how many times each letter occurs. And based on the count of the letters, you build a tree out that looks something like this. And, and the thing is, is it, it's interesting because it has guarantees. It is, as, it is as optimal as you can make it without losing information. And so you could create a tree like this for your emails. Like say that you write in a particular way or you use certain person, people's names more and more such that you use certain, certain characters more often. Maybe because your emails have your name in it, the characters in your name would end up floating towards the top of the tree. So you can create codes that are specific for documents or specifics for your um, language that are going to compress your trees more and more. So let's say you take a large novel written in text and you generate a Huffman code for it and then you store your, your novel using this Huffman code. Well, what you can do is at the beginning of your file, you can put a description of your tree. And that's not very big compared to the novel as, as the entire you know, the entire entirety of the novel. So at the beginning of the file you put your tree and then for the rest of the contents of your file you have the novel but encoded according to your tree. And then you ship that off because it's now going to be all compressed because your frequent letters aren't taking up very many bits. Then so when someone receives that file the first thing they do is they read this tree and they build it and then the rest of the bits they decode it. So this is the basis of some of the lossless algorithms like um, zip, if you're familiar with zip. They build trees in various ways like this. There are some optimizations that they can build into it. For example, they can um, choose to switch trees in the middle of the document. 
So if the first half of your document is all A's and the second half of your document is all Z's, you can build one tree for the beginning of your document and then indicate that you're switching trees and then use a different tree for the second half of your document. And as long as you know sending trees has a little bit of overhead to it, so as long as you're saving more bits by switching trees, you should switch trees. So let me just give you a second to try and encode one of the two. Um, Joy, do you want to tackle Kona? And Lisa, do you want to try doing Maui? Just to make sure that you understand how to manipulate these trees. And uh, we'll just take, uh, let's see, how are we doing? Yo, uh, let's see. Actually, let's skip that, because I, I think we're OK on it. But that is something that you should make sure that you can do OK. You almost have it. I can tell you've almost got it. So Maui Maui is going to be one one zero 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 for M one zero for A zero one one zero for U and then one 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 for I. Um, another special case of a binary tree is the expression tree. Now we've already been using these without actually talking about it as a data structure. We were using these expression trees to talk about our recursion. But when we did recursion, we didn't actually create a data structure that was a tree. We were just thinking about the expression tree as recursion. So we can also use those, we can literally use those trees to keep track of um, expressions like this. And um, in order to evaluate it, you have to go to the bottom of the tree and answer it on the way up. So why don't we pick up next time talking about expression trees. Where we're going with this tree business is that we are going to look at how binary trees can be used to do things very efficiently. So in addition to just looking at the structure of the trees, which is what we've primarily been doing so far, next class we're going to start looking at um, how what we're going to store in the trees, and we're going to put some rules about what kind of data goes in which nodes so that we, we have combinations of data and tree structure working together. And there's a little bit more work we have to do in just trying to understand how we calculate the size of trees and um, just kind of engineering stuff around the trees as well. What I would like to get to is I would like to make sure that by the time we're done, we understand how to work with red-black trees and heaps. And they're kind of complicated. So if you want to read ahead in your copious free time, that might be something that would be good to have a little bit of an idea um, before you come into class and talk about it. OK, last minute questions? All right, good. I'm grateful that the technology worked today and whatever was going on yesterday was just a glitch. If Oh, could you hear it? Yeah. Oh, interesting. No, I didn't, didn't distract me. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'll, I will see everyone tomorrow. If, any, if, you have, if people are having questions about how to get the drone working, feel free to utilize the Slack channel. To, or you guys can communicate with yourself to help each other out. But if you want to ask questions on Canvas and the discussion board, you can do that or in the announcements, and uh, we'll go from there. OK, that's it. See you next class.